else that's out there. I love the idea of hitting the soft loss first, which is the relationship with the tenant. I had this conversation with this really interesting fellow, and I love having conversations with people who have a very different opinion than I do. And this uh, person was talking about, you know, the idea that the relationship, he asked me, he said, do you think it is a, it is a zero sum game in the relationship between a landlord and the tenant? And I had to think about that for a minute. And I thought, I don't think so. Because the thing is, is when you look at the tenant, the tenant will only exist if there's landlords. Otherwise, there's nothing to rent. And vice versa. And, and then the reverse reply. So, so they both rely on each other to exist. So right. That in itself is that, that mutual relationship between them means that there's something that has to happen to make that relationship good. Now the relationship could be parasitic or the relationship could, could be something where it is beneficial for both parties. And right. I think it's up to the landlord to really be, because they're at the position of elevation. Welcome back to the Money Mindset and Mentoring Podcast. We are super excited to have our guest today here, Ed Matthews. He is the owner of Clark Street Capital. And Ed does an amazing business of going into neighborhoods and grabbing the nastiest, the dirtiest, the most messed up multi-residential property and turning that thing into a thing of beauty. So Ed, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Good to see you, my friend. Beautiful. Well, thank you for coming on. Tell me a little bit about your background. How did you get into this business? So I, I actually, I would love to tell you this unique story about how I got into real estate. Uh, I read the Purple Bible and uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad in 2008. Uh, I was mid-career in a um, Silicon Valley. Uh, I was slinging software and services all over the country and in a couple of cases all over the world. And uh, you know, running around with my hair on fire. And I did that for about 24 years in 08, a very good friend of mine gave me the book and I consumed it in like an afternoon and a, and a full day, just, you know, just chewed right through it on a plane ride and, uh, fundamentally changed the way I looked at my future, whatever was coming next. Uh, problem is it took me three years to get the courage to actually pull the trigger on something. But, uh, but you know, in, I bought my first place in 2011 and uh, did that for, you know, we would either I would get a bonus or a commission and or f- flip a house or two, collect that capital, buy another multi and rinse and repeat. We did that for about seven years. And uh, in 2018, I realized that I'd had enough of traveling. I didn't want to travel 150 nights a year anymore. And uh, because I had a, I have a wife who I adore, and I'm pretty sure she still liked me and still likes me today, as do my two girls. And I wanted to make sure that that continued. So uh, we went full time and I've been doing this since February. It's actually six years. Um, That's in, a, in a couple of weeks, it'll be six years. Yeah, it was. I, I'm pretty convinced that at some point, at some time, as you're bopping around the States, slugging the software, that we would have bumped into each other at an airport somewhere. There's, there's no way we didn't bump into each other at O'Hare or DFW <laughs> or something, right? Because I was there it's, every week. Especially because I think, as you had mentioned, you're, you're a fairly tall fellow. Yeah, I'm hard to miss. I don't, I don't <laughs> blend. <laughs> now, when you get into the multi uh, how many, how many units or how many properties do you, are you currently running with, and what sort of yeah? Market? So, yeah. so you're catching me at a kind of a cool inflection point. Um, at our top, we had uh, just short of 200 units. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, we probably have uh, just short of 80. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I am in the process of selling pretty much everything we own here in Connecticut uh, with the intent of doing two things. One, we're launching a fund. And two, I'm trading up. So uh, you know, we're selling off all the fours and eights and tens and fifteens and uh, my goal is to buy 500 units this year, 125 units a quarter in 2020. So going from 200 down to 80, down to zero, and then up to 500 by the end of this year. Uh, yes. It sounds That's crazy, a- but we're about a year, a year or so into executing that plan. And uh, it's so far, so good. So if you know the book behind me, it says the 10X rule book. So it actually doesn't sound crazy to me. It sounds right in alignment with what that book says. Well, I'm glad you and Grant agree. <laughs> that edifies me. So let's go. 
There you go, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. So when you look at the the the, the class that you work with, and we talk about yeah. the strategy that you're using of of rehab uh, to 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 create some value and that sort of right. thing. What what kind of got you over the fear factor of holy crap, I'm I'm over my head. I walked into this place where things are falling to pieces to the idea that this is exactly the model that I need to follow. Uh, there are days to even these days that when I walk in and go, what have I done? But, uh, <laughs> the, you know, the, I think the flipping experience helped me a lot. You know, we've been working with the same, you know, two or three crews of guys. Uh, and in two cases, two of the crews, I've known them since childhood, right? I grew up. Oh, wow. with them. So I, I know them, I trust them. I understand the way they think they understand the way we think, I think. And, um, so the, we have fixed so many crappy apartment buildings and just completely dilapidated single family homes that, you know, short of, uh, short of functional obsolescence, which I tend to stay away from, uh, there really isn't much that scares me these days. I still steer clear of the, of the found, you know, major foundation issues. But other than that, I'm, you know, we're game. I, I'll, I'll bring my buddy Eric in and we'll walk the, walk the property and I'll go, you know, now I'm I'm the glass half full kind of guy, and Eric is kind of the glass half empty kind of guy. And I'll I'll be look, this isn't that bad. And you know that's when he says it's atrocious, but we can fix it. It's okay, <laughs> right? And so it, you know it's a nice yin and yang, and and uh, it's worked really well for you know quite some time now. So and it's fun. That, oh, it is totally fun. I mean, for me, yeah. we we buy the smaller ones still. <clears throat> uh, we went through a rapid uh, transfer of wealth out of our business in 2014, mm -hmm. where I had to recover quite heavily. And then we use real estate actually in the same sort of concept to make that recovery successful. And again, it was finding the, you know, the place that really required a lot of love. Yeah. Uh, maybe it was just in the hands of somebody that just, you know, couldn't manage it or didn't want to manage it. And, uh, and then really taking that thing and making it beautiful. Indeed. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I find that with, you know, some of these properties, they're, there's so many problems that it, it eliminates uh, some competition as well, which I find strategically um, very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you talk about functional obsolescence, are we talking about that, <laughs> you know, say for example, the power to the building is, is, is underserviced and it's too large to make that switch. Or what are we talking about the major things you're looking for that? Cause I'm curious as to what, <clears throat> what your topics, your no-goes are. I look at um, layout. So if you mm. are, if you have to walk through a bedroom to get to the bathroom, yep, um, that's kind of a, okay, can we reconfigure that? If we can, great. If we can't, <clears throat> then that's going to be a hard, you know, a hard apartment um, layout to rent for, you know, a couple or a family, right? So yeah. we tend to, you know, we tend to avoid those. Um you know, as far as uh, if there are egress problems that, you know, would require us to, to um, you know, get really into the structure of the building, we probably avoid those as well. Because, um, mm. you know, egress rules here have changed substantially over the last, <clears throat> you know, 15, 20 years. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think the idea of, and I agree with you on the layouts, that's one of the things when we buy properties is we go through and, and try to change the layouts so that they become actually functional. Like there's nothing worse than where the, the kitchen has no access to an outside or something like that. Right. And, and where the bathroom's in this weird location or, you know, any of these things where there's no fluidity to the living space and it's just not congruent with modern lifestyle. And, and I think, you know, if it can be done in a, in a relatively low cost, without much in structure, then, you know, just a couple of <clears throat> bearing walls, it's really easy. And we've gone through right. and blown out bearing walls and, you know, drop, you know, big, huge concrete walls to try to create open living spaces. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's a lot of work. <laughs> but it's worth it, right? I mean, we've, mm. we've made cathedral ceilings in, you know, yep. the top level of apartment buildings to make it, you know, even more saleable. And yep, we, you know, we changed the, the engineering of the building to do it in a couple of cases. <clears throat> but, you know, I mean, we have a couple of structural engineers who are absolute geniuses and they'll we'll walk them through and I'll be like, what if we did this? And Eric will pitch a fit and then I'll and then I'll say, OK, well, you know, let's go with the guy that let's I'm curious about the person who actually went to engineering school. 
Um, yeah. What does he say? Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, in some cases they're like, all right, you know, here, here are the 12 things you have to do to make it, make it safe. And, uh, We'll go over it. And if it makes sense financially, then we'll do it. Yeah. One of the things that I realized when I was going through structure that I never learned last year was <clears> when uh, you move a staircase to an exterior wall, the amount of structure that has to change yes. in that wall. I never knew. Right. I was just like, it's just an outside wall. And they're like, and then they'd go through and describe no, no. everything that needs to happen. And right. we still ended up doing it. It just, you know, you do it. You <clears> realize <throat> that your staircase that was supposed to be 48 inches is now going to be 46 inches. Right, uh, because you're giving it more space, and structure. you have to replace the the, the center. Uh, you know, from an engineering perspective, you have to replace all the support from the center for the center of the building that that staircase was also used to do. Yeah, uh, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's. I love following the structure, and and talking to the designs. It's just. It, I think one of those things, and I think you probably have it in you a little bit, if not a lot, is just you know just the sense of accomplishment that you get out of running those kind of projects and seeing what they've gone from and just going through and reminiscing over those old, I hope you take photos along yes, the process. Yeah. 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 We didn't for a while and I regret it because we had some really interesting projects that we did that I have the afters and I have the realtor, you know, the pictures from when we bought the place, but nothing in between. Oh. So I regret, yeah, it's a bummer. Um, and there are several of those, but the, you know, it is what it is. We got smarter it's over the years. It's usually when you're trying to think about taking those pictures is exactly when you're going through the most stressful part of the project. <laughs> right. and, and the last thing you're thinking about is taking a picture. You're just like, will the yeah. plumber please show up or will the uh, right. you know city please pass this one uh, variance or whatever else? It right. Is, exactly. Right? Yeah. That's usually exactly when I'm on bended knee at the building department saying, please <laughs> send your inspector out. I have guys that are, you know, they show up, they eat lunch, they go home. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. please stop that. Exactly. <clears throat> And so what's on the, what's on the future horizon for you? When you look at the, you've got, you know, you're obviously doing a huge pivot. Now, I think I remember mentioning you were looking at some different markets as well. We are. Uh, yeah. So here in Connecticut, it tends to be much smaller properties. And in fact, you know, when we looked at, when I originally looked at Connecticut and I live in Connecticut. So uh, one of the things that helped with you know, our whole mantra around we buy crappy apartment buildings from landlords and who aren't really good at their jobs and and we go in and make them clean and safe. A huge piece of that was I knew that I could touch that building. I live almost directly in the center of the state. So if I had to go northeast, south or west, I could be there in an hour. Right. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> that was, you know, so that was interesting. So I was more willing to take on, you know, much more unloved projects, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. you know, buildings that needed a lot more work uh, because I could be there and I could keep an eye on it. So that was kind of converting C minus buildings into C plus B minus buildings in a lot of cases. And, uh, you know, now that we're looking outside of Connecticut, uh, the major reason for that is there are very few large apartment complexes in Connecticut. If I want to go buy 125 units, in Connecticut, I have to go buy 10 buildings. And yeah. that's a lot of moving parts for a small company. That's a lot of moving parts for any company. But the, um, you know, looking at North Carolina, looking at Kentucky, looking at Indiana, where we can find a 40, 50, 60, 100 unit building that meets our criteria, our buy box, our criteria, and allows us to do the same things that we do. Uh, I would much rather focus on one or two projects a quarter and do them well, as opposed to trying to spread out our team and get 10 projects done and be really stressed out. And, you know, some of those people probably won't end up being my friends after the, you know, start of the next quarter. So, and I'd like to avoid that. When but they're the, um, sitting in traffic, not at the job. Yeah, there's a lot of that. That, that's, yeah. that was my day today, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah. I visited six buildings in the last four and a half hours. And, uh, you know, I try to walk every building every month. Right. And yeah. just to make sure that just make sure. And so where before we were converting C minus C buildings into B minus B buildings, uh, now we're probably looking at C plus through B plus buildings and it'll be, yes, it'll be a lot of construction, more remodeling, uh, and upgrades. So mm -hmm. whenever we acquire a building, you know, first, 
first kind of couple of three couple three moves are make it clean and safe, um, start to uh, rehabilitate the relationship with the residents and and figure out you know who we can get back on the same page with and and who's probably not going to stick around. So that then the third step is upgrading the common areas and any open units to our to our standards. And so that means, you know, uh, anything from new paint to new flooring to new lighting to uh, emergency exit signs and, and um, security and new kitchens and new bathrooms and um, yeah, basically new everything. And so the object is, yes, we want to make it more valuable, but really the, the thing I want to prove to the residents as we're rebuilding the relationship is there's a new sheriff in town. We actually care. And, you know, our job here is to serve the residents so that they stay a really long time because <clears throat> kind of the main pillar of our business model is uh, avoiding vacancy and we've gotten really good at it. So, you know, we go in, we make the buildings clean and safe and, and as quickly as possible, make it a place where, you know, folks can be proud to live there. So they stay you know, on average, they stay a little bit, but more than four years, which is almost three times, a little bit short of three times the average here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it makes our buildings a lot more valuable because we don't have to spend money on lease ups and turns and all the other things that <clears throat> my, my peers do on an annual or, you know, 18 month cycle. Yeah. And now you talked a little bit about a box. I think you talked about, you know, you had a buy a, box. Yeah. A buy box. I love the term. It obviously has some 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 stuff in it. Yep. Nobody's going to talk about an empty box. So, what are the things that are in your buy box? So, one of the key ways that we create deal flow is we're very specific and crystal clear on our criteria and how we buy. And so, I provide that to all of the brokers that we target. We want to do business with. Um, we share it with wholesalers to a certain extent, although there's very few wholesalers and where we in the strata where we kind of play, but there are a few. <clears throat> and, um, and even, you know, even uh, property owners to a certain extent. <clears throat> and so very specifically, we're looking for 25 units and above. Uh, these days we're looking for vintage uh, 1980 and above. So that eliminates things like lead paint, lead pipes, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, we look for uh, vacancy or uh, occupancy levels of at least 65% so that I know that the building is somewhat operating. <clears throat> One of the calculations we go through when we're evaluating and underwriting is uh, what's our break even point and, you know, at what point should we be looking at, you know, an operating profit and 65% <clears throat> in that, you know, in that 65, 70, 75, 80, even 85% you know, as a management issue. And so management issues are things that we're really good at. And so they're easily fixed mm -hmm. uh, and far more easy to fix than, uh, you know, taking a hammer and a paintbrush and uh, and scaffolding and siding and all that to a, to a building. <clears throat> you know, we can affect change within a matter of days or weeks when it's a management problem. And uh, that, you know, allows us to to really do a good job of repairing the relationship, taking a huge step forward to fix the community and then start to grow that community back so that, uh, you know, the buildings become cash flow positive as soon as possible. We'll also take on common area and, and unit upgrades as well. Um, probably not as aggressive with regard to the, how, how, we're a little more selective on how far gone we're willing to acquire a building when it's in North Carolina as opposed to Connecticut. Um, but basically, the, the buy box is those three states, North Carolina, Indiana, Kentucky, 25 units or more. Uh, we look for the occupancy rates. Um, and then it comes down to our investment criteria where we need to be able to, from a cash flow perspective, very quickly be able to afford a, you know, a 6 to 8% preferred return for our investors. and. Uh, as quickly as possible, get it to 12 to 16 plus percent um, annual return so that uh, they become worthwhile. And, you know, it becomes interesting to our group of investors and yeah. they decide to, you know, deploy their hard earned money with a project like that, as opposed to sticking in the stock market or going buy an art or whatever else they do with it. Anything else that's out there? <clears throat> yeah. 
Right. I love the idea of hitting the soft loss first, which is the relationship with the tenant. I had this conversation yeah. with this really interesting fellow, and I love having conversations with people who have a very different opinion than I do. And this uh, person was talking about, you know, the idea that the relationship, he asked me, he said, do you think it is a, it is a zero sum game in the relationship between a landlord and the tenant? And I had to think about that for a minute. And I thought, I don't think so. Because the thing is, is when you look at the tenant, the tenant will only exist if there's landlords. Otherwise, there's nothing to rent. And vice versa. And, and then the reverse reply. So, so they both rely on each other to exist. So right. That in itself is that, that mutual relationship between them means that there's something that has to happen to make that relationship good. Now the relationship could be parasitic or the relationship could, could be something where it is beneficial for both parties. And right. I think it's up to the landlord to really be, because they're at the position of elevation. It's up to the landlord to create that environment, the landscape. So that the tenant can say, you know what, I feel comfortable enough that we're going to be working together now exactly. to create this ecosystem for success. Because if they're there and they're living there for three, five, seven years, they're building a life. And that yeah. means their friends are coming over, their family's coming over, and they want them to come to a place. If they're in a situation that obviously they're, they're thinking healthy, they want them to come to a place that they can be proud of. Right. And so if the landlord provides an environment where the common elements are looked after, garbage is cleaned up. You know, and when I talk about, you know, garbage, we're looking at, you know, anything that's unsafe, anything that's just visually unappealing. And then unfortunately, any of the tenants that maybe are a disturbance might be something that also needs to be removed to make that Correct. as a place that they want to invite people over. Yeah. Because if they don't feel safe because the other tenants there are making them feel unsafe, that again goes to, again, it's going to hurt the relationship with the landlord. So I think yeah. you hitting those soft costs and saying that this is our expertise, you have a very quick win right there. And that's not a wind that just sits on the on, on the the P and L because obviously it's going to allow you to to you know recover higher degrees of rent, but it's also going to put you in a situation that it's going to create stability. Uh, you're going to have people that are proud, and proud people will look after the things that they have. Um, I sleep well at night. Uh, they they pay you know our residents on average pay their bills on time. They take very good care of the buildings. Um, yeah. If there is a resident that doesn't quite toe the line in terms of, you know, keeping the common areas nice and clean and all that. They self-police in a lot of cases, um, which is a good and a bad thing. Sometimes that is helpful. Hey, you can't leave your bike out in the hall. Uh, other times it's, you know, Ed, I need you at this building because we've got a, we've got a human problem. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> you know, the, the way that we handle that is we're crystal clear about, uh, you know, the, the, the way that we operate in the rules and we're responsive. I think the the people that live in our uh, buildings, they're good, hardworking people. And in most cases, they're working one, two, sometimes three plus jobs to make it all work. And I respect the hell out of that because I grew up in that family. Mm -hmm. And I know being the child of that type of parent, uh, how hard it is. Um, and so, you know, I think my job and our job collectively is to, I don't want to treat them as tenants. You'll, I, I hope you've picked up, I call them residents and we call them I, residents I for a that. reason. Yeah. Um, it is not a, uh, you know, I've had more than one landlord and I, I will only stand on the soapbox for, for a, a few seconds, but um, I've had so many of my, of my peers here say, you know, being a landlord is a dominance play. You have to establish dominance within your, within your communities. And I completely reject that. Right. Um, and you know, that's coming from a guy I'm, you know, I'm six, four, six, five and block the sun big. I'm, you know, if I want to be intimidating, I can be, I just tend not to be. And, um, I'm happier when I'm not. And, but the fact is, is that people want to be heard. That's it. Mm -hmm. If there's a problem, and they get on our system and they say, hey, we need help. Uh, they get a response immediately. We communicate with them as to when we're going to be able to get to that. Hey, we've got a crew coming on Friday. They'll, they'll take care of that, you know, broken towel rack when, when we're on site. Uh, no, we're not going to come out there just for your broken towel rack. But uh, if you can wait 48 hours, we'll be there and it will be fixed and it'll be perfect. Um, to, you know, blood, flood or fire, which requires me to be on site as soon as humanly possible. I had one today. It's one of the reasons I was out there was 
I got a phone call uh, this morning from one of our residents. Uh, my team got a phone call. Hey, there's, we hear water running, but there's no one in the apartment below us. So something's up. And so we were out there. Turns out we had a burst pipe. Um, mm. And one of our construction guys forgot to turn the heat on when he left from painting the unit that he was painting on, I assume, Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. And, uh, you know, turns out here in Connecticut, it gets cold as it probably does up in your neck of the woods. And uh, sometimes that cold turns into ice and sometimes that ice fills a pipe and bursts it, which it happened today. Um, yeah, that's tough. That's okay. Part of the game. But, yeah. uh, you know, there's and there's systems we have in place in terms of the technology we use to make sure that that stuff doesn't happen on a regular basis. But unfortunately, this is one of the units that we in a building we just acquired and we're in the process of rehabbing and we hadn't gotten to that part yet. So say lovey. Yeah, that's fine. But the I thing is that. The, it's the interesting human being there's a lot of technology that comes out yeah. that you think is going to change the way that buildings are managed. Um, you know, you see those flood things where the meter, they see if the water is abnormally performing. And so it can tell you yep. what's going on or which we the install. powers are normally juicing or any right. of these things that can kind of tell you what's going on and, and give you some advanced notice. I think those things are superhuman. Uh, and the thermostats we install won't go below a certain uh, a certain num, you know, a certain temperature, so that we know that the the building will always be a minimum of sixty five degrees. And if the residents want it warmer, go ahead, crank it up. But um, that way, I know that once we get those thermostats involved installed, um, that uh, we don't have to worry about pipes bursting. So, lesson That's learned. Amazing. Now, we'll let's talk a little bit about. I remember the one thing you were talking about. We were chatting earlier is about building your community. Yeah. And building the community of people who is going to be your your tribe. Talk talk to me a little bit about that. And what does that look like? So, so in terms of the buildings, um, you know, he, here's what I know about any building that we own anywhere in the country. Um, my next set of residents live within about a mile and a half of that building, mm -hmm. and so buildings have brands. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're not so good. And most of them are in between. And uh, if you don't believe me, go on Yelp and check it out. The, 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 the fact is, is that we are acquiring those buildings that have been uh, poorly managed for on one level or another, and we're going in and fixing them. And we want one of the one of the reasons that we want our residents to be proud of where they live is because most likely their friends live in that same circle and in a lot of cases uh, as units come open it's their cousin their friend their aunt their you know their brother um who is interested in the in the building or even if it's not the exact building we probably own a building in the area that we also manage. And so when you create that brand of, hey, these guys are good at what they do, they actually care, they're responsive, and they do what they say they're going to do, that spreads. And so, you know, again, our major, the major pillar in our business model is, is managing vacancy. So if I can keep my vacancy on any particular building under 5%, we're winning, you know, that's a, that's a, that is a really good business and it serves our investors well. It serves our company well. It puts capital in our pockets so that we can reinvest in the buildings and make them even more valuable, add amenities, you know, whatever. Now let's talk about that. Uh, you, you're talking about all the building of the businesses or so the yeah. buildings. Um, you know, you're building now a sort of a digital asset, which is the, the fund. Um, yes. So now we're working in a space that, uh, <clears throat> how does that feel? How's that process going? It's absolutely terrifying. Uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, you know it's 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 a hole in the market in that you know I think that there are there are banks who are really looking for well experienced investors uh, with pristine credit and operating experience and and all that and you know when you're looking when you're when you're looking at me in circa 2010. I wasn't that guy. I had good credit. I had management experience. Did I know what I was doing with regard to investing in properties? No, not at all. Um, other than the books that I read, I was a you know I was a theorist at best. And you know the only way you get practical experience is by doing. And so okay. the fund is a good way for for me and my partner uh, Mike Meyer 
who is who's been in the mortgage and banking business for decades um, to kind of bring together our skills where I can look at a project, I can look at the numbers of the project, but also the project plan and be able to tell fairly quickly once I walk a property if if it's a realistic plan. And so we're going to use that to kind of guide these investors to, to kind of set them up for success. Mike obviously knows the operational piece of running a finance business, uh, so he'll handle you know the the uh, you know the servicing of the loans and and all that. Um, but what it does is it gives our investors a very predictable, um, consistent uh, return. It, it's not it's not a blockbuster return, um, and I'm I can't really talk specifics yet because the lawyers won't let me, but. Uh, but the bottom line is that it'll be live in a couple, this is, you know, we're recording this in mid January and it'll be live February 1st. So, um, the, but the fact is, is that it, it provides a, a predictable, consistent return for our investors. It provides a platform to help early stage, not brand new, but early stage investors get going. Um, it allows us to leverage our experience to help them. And, you know, quite frankly, I also see some of those people as potential partners in the future. So it, it also starts to fill our, um, you know, our community with folks that we would love to do business with as they grow and get bigger and better at what they do. Now, when you're looking at the, the <clears throat> uh, which class are you building that, that fund around? What, what is your... So early stage, it'll be small uh, projects. So small is a relative term, but it'll be single family homes uh, that are flips, uh, burrs, you know, um, uh, properties that people will buy, rehab, uh, refinance, and then rent out. Uh, and then the the others would be small multi, so one to four units. We're going to keep it, you know, we're going to keep it very manageable and uh, and then grow it from there. But I mean, and it's also, that's the market where we live here in Connecticut. That mm -hmm. is a 90 plus percent of the deals that happen in the state of Connecticut happen in that little box. Yeah. So now that's adjacent to the stuff that you're doing with the big multi. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got a two pronged yeah. approach. Correct. Yeah. So nice. I'm, I'm out big game hunting with the, with the, the, uh, you know, the much larger projects. Those tend to be joint ventures and syndicates. Um, mm -hmm. And then the fund is, is more for, uh, you know, it's an arbitrage play to be. And so, you know, we will give a preferred return. We'll lend out at, you know, four, three to five points more than we're uh, paying out. And mm -hmm. then we'll also charge points up front to run the operation itself. And, you know, when there's a, when there's extra money, we'll distribute to the investors and everybody wins. That sounds like an amazing thing. So when Talk people want to get in on that, what, what's the next steps? What would they do to, to, to connect with you? So uh, best thing to do would be to hop on our website at clarkstreet.com, clarkst.com. Uh, we have an investors page. If, and if you are interested in that, uh, there's a Calendly link that will put you right direct on my calendar. And I'm happy to lay out any of the projects that we have in the pipeline that I'm, that I'm allowed to talk about. And I can even give previews of the ones that I can't quite give details yet, but I can tell you that they're coming. Um, beautiful. Beautiful. Well, Ed, you know, I've got such a passion for what you're doing. I know for us, it made such a huge difference in, in our position in wealth and in getting us out of a, a very difficult uh, time using real estate to really grow and amplify uh, has just been such a, an amazing thing. And, and, and then, you know, the second thing, which gives me and, and both myself and my wife, you know, huge, uh, I guess, lovey-dovey, touchy-feelies, is that we're creating homes, you know, like we're creating homes for people. And, 100%. and the idea that they can go home and they can be proud of the place that they live, there's something to be said about that. And, 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 and that just brings me true joy. It's uh, me too. Um, it's, it's one of the things. So my two daughters are not at all interested in this business. One wants to be a physical therapist. Another one wants to be a, a work for the FBI. So I didn't, gr I didn't raise real estate investors. Much to my chagrin, yes. but that's okay. Yeah, yeah, you never know. Um, but the thing is, is that I do take them around to see the buildings, and it's uh, it's very gratifying that they see how we manage these buildings and how we treat our residents, and and uh, you know the fact that that we're we do a good job. 
So well, they're both going into industries of service. So that's you know, true. There's a there's something to be said about you taught them about the idea of service and uh, and giving. So I think yeah. that's uh, that's commendable. Thank you. I blame their mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's definitely been a pleasure, guys. This is the Money Mindset and Mentoring Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We will catch you on the next one. Thank you so much, Ed. Appreciate you. My pleasure.